The next speaker is uh, Steve Hill from the Geologic Survey of South Australia. And uh, the title of his talk are, is SA Mineral System Drilling Program. I've got extra time so you can speak slowly. Oh, don't, don't, go, don't go teasing me. Okay, thanks, <laughs> thanks that, Dave. Now let me just check this. Did the bloke talking about laser ablation, ICPMS, break the laser? No, no, it works. No, no, okay, no. I thought he broke it. Oh, was it upside down? Yeah, okay, no worries. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for um, coming along and, and hearing about a bit of what I want to share with you about really where government geological surveys can be in a lot of what we've heard already this morning and even over the last few days. I think it's great that we've been acknowledged in government as being part of it, so um, let's, let's have a think about where, where we can go with that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is really partly why we're doing it um, and why we're doing it in government um, and then a little bit about what we're doing it, not just saying, hey, this is a problem, we've got to do this. Let's, let's talk about what we're trying to do and where that's gone um, and, and particularly in the drilling area. And then I'll talk a little about where to next, but I'll be, be careful not to steal too much thunder from the next speaker, Richard Hillis, who I think will be going in, into that in a lot more detail. Okay, so discovery challenge. Um, this is one of my favourite slides that, that I think Pitch tells a thousand words about what large parts of Australia uh, look like. This is what is confronted, what a lot of um, recently trained or new newbies that have come out of university as a, as a geologist uh, are often confronted with when they look at their um, mineral tenement or their geological mapping area or so forth. And, you know, it, it doesn't all look exactly like this, but effectively 80% of Australia is, is something like this. I saw... Peter Winterburn's talk yesterday, he had a similar sort of figure for uh, Canada as well. Um, and one of the problems is then that, you know, as a, as a mineral explorer drilling, there has been, I, I hate to say it, a bit of a temptation for um, a, a, many of the explorers to use drilling and the, and the pre-competitive data that goes with that in a similar way to you might... That the, to people might have, with that game Battleship, do you, do you guys have that game in Canada? Am I talking some... Is this some twisted Australian thing. No, that's great. I, I put this on LinkedIn a while ago and all LinkedIn keeps sending me is things about North Korea and all that because I mentioned the word battleship. So, But anyway, um, so, you know, bump drillers and things like that. How can we do better? We talk about the failing success rate and failing discovery rate. What can we do to actually improve how we do it and put the geology back into um, what we're doing? And, and in government, you know, we're often tossing around these two sort of endpoints where you can kind of be a passive receiver or, or, and just let industry do their stuff and bask in the glory of industry's discoveries or we can actually get involved and, and try to make what is happening with the investment money coming into our jurisdiction, our state, our province, whatever, and make a difference, okay? So partner to prosper sort of stuff that Richard talked about in the lunchtime session yesterday. And really the opportunity came up for us in the Geological Survey of South Australia through our involvement in DTCRC, the Deep Exploration Technologies Cooperative Research Centre. And we, we've been a partner in that, in that group, but we wanted to make sure that we made, made hay while the sun was shining on it and really get fully behind in, in, um, in supporting it. And to do that, we wanted to take on a lot of what we've heard about this morning and change the way governments do pre-competitive or collaborative drilling. Pre we have a previous um, pedigree of collaborative single hole drilling, but we wanted to take it further with a much more coordinated program. Um, so you know, we, we ended up um, putting in close to, um, close to $3 million in this, and that, the leverage that came out of that was just a great story for government. And we're talking here about a really a coordinated 14 hole uh, program with a large number of industry, research, service provider uh, and government um, collaboration. And, and we think this is perhaps one of the first of its kind that embraces such a large spread of collaborators. I know this is a terrible cartoon. I think every time I show it, uh, you know, I have to agree that this, is, this, has, this has been a useful cartoon in the past perhaps, but this is not really why I've put this up to say, oh, this is, a, you know, this is the geological model exactly that we're testing but I'm putting it up because it shows the sort of thing that we're trying to do here. And that is rather than that bump drilling one hole wonder sort of government type of uh, program, what we're trying to do here is use a coherent array of holes 
to answer questions about mineral systems and answer questions about how lots of little sniffs of mineralisation can coherently fit together and therefore perhaps even improve our potential for mapping and predicting mineral discovery in the area. And this is the example that, um, um, that really relates to this part of the Gawler Craton around Olympic Dam and the, the volcanic cover that's the same age as the Olympic Dam mineralisation, the, the Gawler Range volcanics look something like this. And as I said, lots of sniffs of mineralisation in this area. This is central South Australia and we can see here the volcanic cover and all these little mineral occurrences through here that a whole range of junior and mid-sized companies are, are um, making all sorts of announcements about. But no big discoveries and nothing that coherently is pulling them together. So let's have a look at what the drilling did find. We did find that um, there was a lot to, to talk about with with um, mineral systems and fluid flows and epithermal veining in the volcanics that was previously thought to be a barren system. So a lot of people were just punching through that volcanic cover until they got to the underlying basement and this program started to show that there's quite a lot to talk about actually within that volcanic cover. And a small, a, a junior company in the area, Investigator Resources, have um, at about the same time and following the drilling made some really quite significant um, discoveries within that volcanic system. It also enabled us to pull together ideas about the depth of cover. And this was, I think James said, embrace failure in his talk. Well, this was the first hole that we drilled in this program. And we thought that the, um, the cover was going to be about 500 metres thick. We drilled um, over, over a, um, was it 1.3 kilometres, over a kilometre thick. And we still didn't hit the underlying basement. And what that made us do is reassess how we were looking at the depth of cover and bringing in hard rock seismic um, workers. And we actually found that from that modelling that the cover is indeed very deep there. And, and let's be frank, it's probably well out of the economic search space for the sort of systems that could be in that area. Um, the mineralising fluid flow, as I said, um, some interesting insights into um, what's happening within the volcanics, not just at, for hosting mineralisation, but as I say here, as the through flow, looking at the volcanic units and also the structures that are important there. I think I have to stand. I think most speakers sort of twist their arm like this and... No, that didn't even work that time. Oh, no, you get your finger out of the way. Okay. Um, and also the traps within those mineral systems. And in this case, we, we drilled several holes to test that mineralisation model about... Um, the margins of the Gawler Range volcanics and the underlying reactive rocks that, um, that we, we found some um, very interesting sulphide systems in that area that hadn't been previously well understood. So that's great. That's some of the geological highlights. Where can you get more information on this? We have, of course, our website that um, has a lot of the reports and videos. We have our core library that displays the core. That's a great geological story, but it's really more than just a geological drilling program and I think that's really building on the themes of some of the previous speakers this morning. Fantastic leverage of government investment. Why wouldn't you want to be part of these sorts of things? Fantastic um, knock-on into the um, supply industry, the METS industry in, in the state. Um, employment, this is all great news for governments. So if there's people here in, from other geological surveys looking at the sort of arguments for these sort of programs, these things speak volumes in government um, and the expenditure. But these t this one here um, I think has been really important, the engagement with the traditional owners. So getting the, the Aboriginal communities involved in the access to the area. And I thought I had a point up here about this and apologies for promising it. Also getting the regulators in government involved in this process. So by having the South Australian government involved in this program, using the new technologies, thinking about what the future might hold, it's already getting us to think about things like the data delivery and the regulation. And some of the things that we're looking at now is offering that, are, are offering that flexibility for land clearance in a regulatory sense and, and, and what sort of buffer zone should we include around these holes that can give us some of the flexibility that, that Paul Agnew was asking uh, James about um, earlier this morning. 
we, we've heard a fair bit about this, but I do want to say that one of the other things that we're really proud to have been part of was the DTCRC technology pull-through in this program. But also, how can we match that in the government? And one of the big things has been a new investment in at the South Australia Drill Core Reference Library. I think it's easy to think of some of the government drill core libraries as a big shed that holds lots of dusty core. I would like to say that that is not what we're looking at in South Australia. We're looking at, one, a very nice building that people want to be in, but one that does a lot more than just host the 7.5 million metres of drill core that we hold in, in this library. So it's a big facility, but it's these value adds that we're offering in what we think that have a strong emphasis on real-time, non-destructive analysis. So here we've got um, the viewing hall where we're trying to use a lot of natural light. You can lay out over two kilometres of drill core in one, in one sitting through here. The um, analytical laboratory, as I said, real-time, non-destructive analysis. So you can come and look at the core and then book up the analysis that could go with that and walk away at the end of the day with, with further answers than just having to cut up blocks and send it off to a lab and wait for months for results to come back. And then the, the immersive 3D um, laboratory, because what we're hearing about here is the generation of a lot of data with drilling programs. And so what we think will happen is that looking at the core will be part of it, but it's also being able to view that data that goes with the core or goes with the drilling program and then being able to, as James said, cycle between the two and start making even greater insights there. There's some of the analytical um, equipment and partners that we have in this library. We often refer to it as an incubator of really developing a lot of these techniques. It's great to see a lot of these groups are actually at the conference. We've got the, the Mineralize group from Sweden. We, we have a, an XRF core scanning um, device there. Um, the reflex equipment, and we have the IQ logger that's taking uh, making structural measurements down through the core in rapid time. Gold Sniffer, I've seen G uh, Jim from Gold Sniffer at this conference, um, which is really using optical techniques for, for gold and other precious metal detection. Hyperspectral uh, mineralogy. Uh, there we go, Aaron, the uh, Olympus Vanta that we have at the facility. And then the Reflex Press that works really closely with that as well to make press powder pellets. And, you know, we're really proud of being able to offer that, not only for the geological survey work, but for our industry in our state. Because as I said, we're there to, to do what we can to make that industry successful. Also, it's changing the way that we do our data release, that real-time large volume of data. It's, it's um, led to a lot of upgrades and enlargements of our, um, our really resource information uh, data delivery system. And what we're doing now is not just providing the geological data, but we're also providing a lot more environmental data, so vegetation communities, traditional ownership type information that also goes hand in hand with this future and of, of uh, mineral exploration. So I'm just going to wrap it up by saying a little bit about where to now, but as I said, Richard, don't worry, I, won't, I don't want to steal your thunder for, for your next talk, but, but really, that's all great stuff, really exciting, but we want, we want more, we want to take it further, and really where we're positioning ourselves now is this idea of, a, of an Australian national drilling initiative. That is, this sort of workflow and approach and applying it across Australia. Okay, we have big frontiers where we don't have much subsurface information. We really have a big call for, for improving the mapping subsurface and, and, and the information and really this sort of coordinated approach. We see similar to the revolution that happened in in geological mapping across the country and geophysical acquisition across the country. And so, um, really, it's the development of these technologies that start to make these things economical and possible. And currently in Australia, um, there is a, a new cooperative research centre bid called Minex CRC that's about 3D drilling, and this National Drilling Initiative is a big part of that that's particularly engaging researchers and government surveys. And the idea is, as I said, with the reduced costs of drilling, and, and, and Richard will be talking a bit about this. I, I'm telling you what you're going to talk about, Richard. I hope you are actually going to do that. But um, that, that really, if you look at the existing 
um, holes that are available in this. This is the um, Olympic domain of the Eastern Gawler. Then we look at the potential now for, for increasing it. I'm not saying that we'd be drilling it on a grid. It's just there for, for schematic purposes, but an array of, of holes through this area that really increases our confidence and in information of subsurface geological mappable criteria. Okay, so these are the sorts of things that, that we're really keen to be moving into next. And, and really, not just the new drilling, I also think that there's a big um, area for upgrading the data that's associated with legacy drill holes. As I said, we have 7.5 million metres of drill holes in our library. Let's start looking at that material. I'd like to thank you very much. Hopefully that's given you all something to think about. Thank you.